Hello, and welcome to On the Marie Curie Couch, the podcast that aims to break down taboos and start open, honest conversations about death and dying. I'm Jason Davidson. I'm a social worker by profession, and I've worked in palliative care, hospice care, and bereavement support services for more than a decade. Each episode, we're going to be speaking to a well-known guest to find out about how they feel about their own mortality and how their personal experience of bereavement has shaped the way they live their life. Today, I'm on the Marie Curie couch with David Lamy. David's been the Labour MP for Tottenham for 20 years. Having served as a minister under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, David was appointed Shadow Secretary of State for Justice and Shadow Lord Chancellor by Keir Starmer earlier this year. Once a practicing barrister, David authored the influential Lamy Review, which looked at the treatment of Black, Asian and minority ethnic people in the criminal justice system. David was born in Tottenham and still lives there with his wife, the artist Nicola Green, and their three children. I'll be talking to David today via a video call. David Lamy, welcome to the Marie Curie Couch. I'm going to start, David, today by asking if you can tell us about a significant death or deaths that you've experienced in your life. I think the most significant death for me was the loss of my mother back in 2008. Um, I had lost my father in 2003, um, but my dad had left me and our family when I was 12. So I was aware that he was dying, but was to some extent removed from that death, although I can come back to that. But there's no doubt about it. My mother meant the world to me and, you know, I wouldn't be here were it not for her in so many ways. So her loss was definitely the most profound bereavement I've had. Can we go right back, David, to talk a bit about your mum's illness? Was she ill for a while? Was it something that was sudden? Well, you know, it was very sad because my mother had only shortly before retired and was very much looking forward to being an active grandparent. I and my wife had had my elder son Joshua. Um, my wife was pregnant with Theo during the period, but basically she was starting to feel ill in 2005-06. She had been complaining about backache. She had wounds that weren't healing, little ones on her finger and things, and bits of bloating and stomach cramp. And had I, I remember I bought her a bed. I went to Warren Evans and bought her this new mattress that it was, it was to help her with her back. But it, it continued. And, you know, she had several meetings with the GP. Um, they couldn't get to the bottom of it. And then at some point in 2006, I think the middle of 2006, I remember the call. I was in the car on the way to deliver a speech. It's quite a big speech. I was pretty sure I was the culture minister at the time under Tony Blair and um, and my sister was with my mother um, and they said that she had a lump the size of a melon um, in her in her stomach and it was ovarian cancer and um, I just remember that call and that sort of sinking feeling and the shock of it really I, I mean I delivered the speech you know but I was really thrown. But I, I sort of knew I had to be a rock for my mum. I mean, she'd been a rock for me. And I made the decision at that point that I would attend every single hospital appointment with her, every single chemo appointment, help her navigate the NHS, who were wonderful, by the way, really, really wonderful. But obviously, um, we had four rounds of chemo and she was on her own you know my mum was a single mum so it was it was tough it was tough and it was hard and she she never cried not really visibly she never 
you know, she had a great faith, my mum. She was bewildered by it all, couldn't quite believe it. And she never really showed anger, but she certainly was, you know, not vaguely ready to go. And she was determined to last as long to see, see my second son born, Theo, and she actually made that. She wanted also to go back to Guyana, where she was from, but um, didn't, didn't succeed in that. But yes, it, you know, it was ovarian cancer that took her, and it's, it's not a very nice cancer at all, is the truth, if any harm. What kind of conversations were you all having as a family after your mum got her diagnosis, either with her or, you know, with your own wife or siblings? I remember saying to my wife, you know, and we were newly married, one, then two young children, uh, Nicola pregnant uh, for a period. And I, I remember saying to her, look, I have to prioritise mum. I've got to prioritise mum. Obviously, I, I had a huge job. I was a minister in the government. Um, lots of attention and pressure on me um, by definition. You know, I stand out <laughs> in, in public life. Um, if I screw up, it's in the papers. A young family that and, and, and issues there because I wanted to be a great dad to my kids. My dad wasn't such a great dad to me. But I said to Nicola, I look, I've, I've got to prioritise mum. I want to make all these appointments, or at least initially. Um, uh, I want to tag team with my, I, I tag team with my other siblings. Um, when I, you know, had to leave an appointment, you know, our mum was doing chemo or something and they would, over, they would take over from me. But I knew I had to be an important rock. And I, and I wanted to visit her as much as I could. And I would, you know, Parliament would finish late at night. And I would go to her home and, and we would talk into the night and then I would go home. So it was quite hard on my wife. And my wife loved my mother as well. And mum insisted on keeping up the childcare. She, she loved having my eldest Joshua over uh, in the cot and he slept off, you know, he'd start in the cot but end up in her bed and she, you know, she hardly wanted to give him back, yeah, even though she was going through chemo. Um, you know, I remember that vividly. Um, and I suppose in terms of discussion, we, we didn't talk about dying very much. It was only towards the end of the two years when it was clear that it was coming back and she wasn't in remission. And then, you know, chemo was not indicated any longer that she showed some sort of, uh, not vulnerability, but she she said, will my grandchildren remember me? She was, because they were babies. And I said, they will remember you because I'll make sure they remember you. And it was a very wistful time, is how I, but, but also I do recall it being wonderfully intimate. I mean, the thing about cancer, assuming that it's a cancer where you get a bit of time, you get the person with it, with this accelerated dying. I mean, you know, they, they're going through chemo, they lose their hair, they shrivel up a bit, they, they, they look visibly older. But it is the most special time to say goodbye. And I am so, so very grateful for those, those two years. I had made a decision earlier to come back from the United States. I, 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 had, I went to Harvard, I was a young lawyer in California, I was succeeding and doing well. Um, and I remember just missing family, missing my mother, missing the UK. And it was a bit of a decision point. Do I come back or do I stay? And I'm so grateful I came back. And my mother was a key part of me wanting to come back. I mean, obviously, at that stage, I didn't realise I was going to go into politics. But I am so grateful that we had this period. And that, as I say, there's, it's an intimate period when someone is dying with cancer over this protracted couple of years it was and um and, and it was very special we had some wonderful conversations mum was dying during for her i'm going to get quite emotional now the most extraordinary um political moment of her life uh, which was the election of a friend of mine, Barack Obama, um, as president of the United States of America. And 
she was hugely captivated by whether he would become president. She didn't live to see uh, whether he would become president. But I can't tell you, she read every single anything that was written about about his campaign uh, in the papers at that time. Now, my mother was someone who had read the mirror all of her life. And um, we wondered if it was the illness, but she started to ask us to bring the Guardian, the Times, the Independent, the Telegraph into the hospice so that she, or hospital, so that she could catch up on what was happening with Barack Obama. And she implored me to go over and see him, which I did, and, and come back and tell her every last detail of the campaign. And I took a great bunch of um, my staff and things we went over to help on the campaign and we met with, with him. You know, I got to know him because we both went to Harvard and that was very, very, you know, she didn't live to see it, but I can't tell you, it was a, it was a big backdrop to her loss. It was one of those moments for her that this could at all have been possible in her lifetime. And of course, of course it was. Now a lot has come since Obama <laughs> became president in a way I'm so pleased that she's not been around to see it because she would have been, she would have been so upset. But but it's just a memory I have of 2008-2007 period, which was which was for people like my mother an amazing that this this could come to pass. And as I say, my mother was my best friend. I mean, we were very close. She was my best friend, my number one ally, a supporter, confident. She always wanted to know what was happening in, in politics and in, in my life. She loved gossip. She was just terrific. I was blessed with an extraordinary human being as my mother. It's really wonderful hearing about the gratitude you know now kind of in hindsight because you didn't know it was going to happen this coming back from the states being in this situation where you've got a wife and a young family and a demanding role at work that then you're able to somehow say well i'm going to prioritize i want to prioritize my mum at the minute and then having that period of a couple of years, which sounds like it was very much focused on treatment, actually, and surviving that, and as you say, navigating the NHS and appointments and systems. And then you said it got to a point where there was no more treatment options anymore. And that happens for lots of people. And that's when things will often change. Often the conversation changes then. And I know your mum said she spoke about will the children remember me? And I'm assuming, David, that was her entry into a conversation about her own death. Did she say more than that? Did you, did you have open conversations about death and dying and planning for death? Well, my mother was very religious, as am I. We had a great relationship with our local priests. So in a sense, because we had this sort of Christian family, I don't know if we needed to talk about death in quite the pronounced way that I think your question suggests, because there was a sense in which we were at peace with death um, and what, what would come. And my mother certainly, her spirituality was very important to her. You know, she was always visited in the wonderful Marie Curie hospice in Hampstead Belsize Park where she was based and, and at home. She took communion throughout. Sometimes I joined her. Um, we didn't talk about the funeral, but I, oh, oh, we did talk about the funeral. Sorry, we did talk about what I'm saying. Of course we did. We talked about where she wanted to be buried and I asked her where she would want to be buried. Found those moments and I remember her you know, going up and down on, do I want to be cremated or buried? Do I want to be buried in this country or do I want to be back in Guyana where she could be buried alongside her adoptive stepmother um, and in a sort of family plot? And in the end, we decided together that she, that she would be buried in Guyana. And, and that was quite important to me. And, and I did take her ashes to Guyana. We had another ceremony there. And I... 
I visited many, every time I'm back in Grand I visit, so I visited my mother's grave a good six or seven times um, since her death. And, and I stood there with my kids on two or three occasions with her. And that's very, very special. Um, and we talked about, she wanted white horses and to have a sort of, you know, be sort of walked through the streets on a, on a, on a, on, on the back of these horses. Um, and in the sort of, sort of quite fashionable in the sort of East End. Um, um, and she'd seen that before and rather liked that. So I certainly set that all up and it was quite amazing actually, you know, after this wonderful sort of Anglo-Catholic service with, where we had the London Gospel Choir <laughs> and the choir of the church. The music was fantastic. It choreographed this amazing service. Um, her body was drawn through the streets because she was cremated in deep east london from so from top so that was quite special so we did talk about that and we also had a, a difficult conversation which was only about you know a few weeks before her death uh about her will and her wishes which needed to be put together what was difficult about that was that because she didn't want to talk about it she didn't really want to talk about it and she hadn't completely organized who should be the executor and things and um, the business of assembling, you know, bank accounts and this little pension I've got and this, that, that sort of stuff, by that point made her feel quite weary. She was very tired. So we could have had that conversation a lot earlier than we did, in fact. But she was very tired, very weary. Um, I think in, I wouldn't say it was pain, but quite a lot of discomfort by that stage. And of course, one of the reasons we, Marie Curie, do this podcast is to encourage people to have those conversations and hopefully have them earlier on if they get the opportunity, you know, to talk about some of the practical planning. I was interested and curious, I think, as well about what faith or, or religion, how that either impacts on the kinds of conversations people will have about death and dying. So I think you used the word, I hope I get this right, I think you used the word uh, accepted that death was going to happen. And because of your faith or religious belief then, um, you know, that helped you and your mum with that. I think, you know, the thing is, we were a very spiritual family and my mother was a very spiritual woman. And, you know, I remember the last time I was with her where she was fully conscious in the hospice. And I said to her, Mum, look, I've been meaning, I wanted to just tape you talking about your upbringing in, in, in Guyana and about your mother and how you started and what, because we don't talk enough about about that. And I you know, I think I'm going to write a book down the line and I and I really want to get this down. And she talked and she talked. I was so pleased to have captured that conversation, which I did subsequently put into my first book. Um, I captured the conversation for which I was very grateful. And I remember she then, I, then I said, oh, look, I've got to leave now. And it must have been about 7, 7.30. And she said, will you just help me to the loo? And I, and I helped her to the loo um, and then helped her back her bed. And she said, oh, you know, darling, I, I was looking at the, um, you know, the, the carpet or something. And she said, I'm seeing, I'm seeing double. I think I'm traveling, she called it. And traveling is a, is a, is a it's used very much in um, West Indian African cultures. It's the idea that you're sort of moving towards your ancestors. And she became very emotional. She started to sort of cry. She started to run and, and she started to laugh. And she was very peculiar. But what was clear to me was that my conversation with her had prompted something, pushed her to something. Clearly, she started to think about her mother and that she was close to seeing her mother. And it made her first sort of tears roll down her eyes, but then a sort of laughter. And I have to tell you, <laughs> if I am in that point, I will be. I will be dying at some point, and if someone brings my, I'll, I'll be the same. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and um, and she said to me, <laughs> she said, "My mother's sense of humour." She said to me, "Is this what is this what they say LSD feels like?" <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> is this what they call tripping? She said. <laughs> it is a cheeky, cheeky, uh, cheeky way. Anyway, I, I sort of, I, you know, I kissed her goodbye and I left her. And then I remember getting a call, um, early in the morning. You know, six o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning from the hospital saying, "Look, you've got to come now. She's, you know, taken a turn for the worst and." Um, she's definitely into the last stages, round up the family, and, and you need to come down here. Um, so I say that to just to, to say it's not entirely about religion. It's this sort of spiritual thing. That's that's not just the faith that you have. It's also which, but she definitely had. And for us, is a very um, Catholic faith. But um, it, uh, it it was just a certain kind of spirituality that my that my mother had uh, and i say that because i i was also very close to my mother-in-law who died a couple of years ago and i adored my mother-in-law again a great ally wonderful woman took everyone as she found them uh, she was an artist a photographer a wonderful woman um, and she was fully engaged in life but absolutely not someone who who sort of faced her death. She 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 did not want to die. <laughs> she fought death right to the end. And even though she was religious, um, that was not something she was really coming to terms with <laughs> um, at all. So I saw a sort of different kind of dying uh, with my mother-in-law. And I think that's a really important thing to acknowledge as well, that no two deaths are the same, you know, and they can't be. And as you've just described, stuff's, you know, experiences of end of life aren't just influenced by religion, but thinking in a spiritual sense, they're influenced by the lives we've led and who we are and, you know, where we're from. And uh, I think, you know, th th those those sort of, um, whether they're symbols or rituals around death and thoughts and beliefs, like the travelling. I like that. It was a beautiful story. Every day and night, Marie Curie nurses and frontline staff give vital support to dying people and their families. We rely on the generosity of the public to deliver our care, but due to the coronavirus pandemic, our fundraising activities are grinding to a halt. We urgently need you to donate today. Visit mariecurie.org.uk forward slash donate. When we got to the hospice, by the way, by this point, it was myself, my brother, sister, aunts and uncles were beginning to gather. You know, she did sort of slip into a, I suppose it was like a sort of semi comatose situation. As, as the as the breathing starts to slow but and it went on for a good three days or so actually and there was one point where it was only 24 hours before she died that a particular aunt came to visit and as I say my mother was in a sort of sober measured anglo-catholic place in terms of her faith and this particular aunt that came was in an evangelical um almost theatrical place in terms of grief and she started to sort of holler and scream and and carry on when she saw my mother in lying there in in her bed she was in a, a coma by this point and and even then because my aunt was being so theatrical in displaying her grief my mother sort of woke momentarily from her coma and said um darling please don't embarrass me it's, it's such a lovely hospice. Please, please lower your tone. Let's slip back into this. Slip back into this this coma and die twenty four hours later. So she she was she was absolutely. The other thing she said, and this is I've seen this also in in grief over the years with relatives that have died. Is is of course she was very grateful that, as she put it, she was dying from the bottom up. So it's also taking those moments to give thanks. So not only did I find with the cancer that we had these two years and it was, we were, spent a lot of time together, very tight, very special, but also my mother reminded us that she was dying. She said, look, you either died from the head down or the feet up and I'm dying from the feet up, which means that I'm still here right to the end. It's only when you've been with loved ones 
you know, with, 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 with either Alzheimer's or, or some cancers where you haven't been able to connect with them in quite that way that you realise how special it is, even though you're losing someone, that they're there with you right up until the last. And even as she took her last breath and we were all around her, um, you know, she was, she, was, she was in the room, she was with us, um, she was wishing us well, she was, she was at peace. What was your mum's name, David? Rose. Rose. <laughs> Instead of name. And actually just saying her name makes me well up. Because I haven't said her name in a long, long time. Um, her name was Rosalind, but she was called Rose by her friends and Mary by her family as a sort of family name. Um, and she was a, you know, she was a Rose. <laughs> And she had great friends and who, um, many of whom I'm very grateful for because they would visit, they would support her. Um, she had a wonderful colleague, Maureen, who's a sort of great East End sort of Cockney woman that was, was with her right to the last, would, took care of her and fed her and supported her and, and, and just, just wonderful friends and family. Um, she loved cooking. Um, you know, people came from miles around to, to experienced my mum's cooking she was at her happiest when um people were enjoying her delicious food she loved family she loved children um she'd been a kindergarten teacher um back in guyana loved kids loved supporting other people's children loved food loved family that was my mother but but actually quite a shy woman um you know she could become very shy uh, you know around um, people with status or public figures. Um, she was very, very supportive of me and proud of what I've done, but would become almost tongue-tied if I thrust her into a situation with, um, you know, a political situation with important people. David, first off, thank you for sharing Rose's story, some of Rose's story. You know, it's so wonderful to hear. I was going to ask about your dad because you mentioned him at the beginning and wondered if you would mind telling us a bit about your dad's death. Well, my dad died of lung cancer. He died in the States. He left me and our family when I was 12. He died in 2003. I remember it vividly because we got this message um, from a family friend that he was in contact with in the States that he was dying. It was during the run-up to the Iraq war, um, which was a very intense time in, in politics, obviously in the country. And I had to make a decision about whether I would go to the States and, 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 and be with him. Um, all of us as siblings had to weigh that. And I decided that I wasn't going to go back, that I didn't, you know, I didn't feel that I wanted to open the Pandora's box that had been my father's life. Um, he died a pauper. Uh, he'd always drunk and smoked heavily, but he, he died with very, very little. Um, and, but I did go back after he died and I, I went back a couple of times and I was very, it was important to me to um, give him a headstone. He didn't have a headstone because, you know, as I say, he died with nothing. And, um, and I, I forgave my dad. Um, you know, I, I, again, wanted to be at peace with my dad. And I do go back to the States from time to time, and I'm in that part of the States to, to visit his grave and tend to it and, um, and talk to him. Um, dad had his demons and had his challenges and had left his family. I know that he, again, was very proud of me and um, proud of his kids, but, but um, you know, he, he, he was a bit of a troubled soul. I just think that deeply respectful gesture about giving someone a headstone, was that part of the forgiveness? It was the part of the, it was something I could do financially, and he deserved that dignity. You know, my dad deserved that. Um, he was a um, kind man. He was a fun, 
uh, charming man. He made a lot of people smile, a lot of people laugh. He was this kind of guy that, you know, he'd go into the pub and, uh, and spend his change buying drinks for everybody else. <laughs> you know? um, um, one of those people that was pretty tough on his family, but my God, you know, his friends thought he was great. Um, anyway, he deserved the dignity of recognition of a life lived and definitely forgiveness. Um, and so I wanted to, to play my role in that. What was your dad's name? David. <laughs> I was David Jr. for a lot of my youth. <laughs> David, what was grief like for you and what helped you with your grief? Well, my experience of grief when you've had a fantastic relationship like the one I had with my mother and that we had this special two years to come to terms with what was happening, to say the things that we needed to say, to experience what we needed to experience, was actually that grief was hard, tough, painful, but not scarring, is what I'd say. And if anything, the hardest bit of the grief is what's left behind. It's, it's the, you know, experiencing your siblings experiencing grief in different ways at different times thinking that you'd be able to support each other but having to come to terms that you can't always support each other because people are experiencing very different ways to to be and, and the nature of grief um i really found very helpful bereavement counseling uh, again because of the job I was doing I, I wanted to be structured in the way I approach grief and I'm so grateful to Marie Curie for the bereavement counselling that was offered um, for weeks after uh, mum died um, and a lot of that counselling is actually about how you're handling literally the loss. She's gone and there's this space and frankly everyone is floundering in this space and what does this new look like and how are you going to deal with this new and that was a story in the family that went on for, for for several years um and then i think i've realized that where the relationship has been perhaps less functional there have been problems there have been issues and certainly uh, in relation to my father and i've seen this in other families because i as a constituency MP, people come to you at toughest moments in their life, and grief is one of them, where family, family stuff has come up, dispute has come up. And, and again, it, you, you realise that grief can be a hell of a lot harder if the relationships have been less secure, they've been more problematic. Um, and again, different siblings, partner left behind, there's a sort of complexity really that that makes makes grief and dealing with grief very very hard and i always say it's a bit like um it's like driftwood at the bottom mm -hmm. of the ocean it's long fallen to the bottom of the ocean but bits are coming off the ship and drifting up to the surface and you can't really control when it comes up to the surface but you have to kind of ride it when it does if you try and suppress it run from it hide from it it will catch up with you sooner or later and in fact it can overwhelm you, it can, it can, you know, the stress of it can, can, can take you under as well. So that's my experience of bereavement. And as I say, I found counselling really important and definitely recommended that to others who are experiencing it. And I think there's, you know, not everybody requires counselling, as it were, you know, I think it's just good to say that. And this, it's, it's, um, but there's something about talking about grief and loss and, and death and dying and bereavement and having a place to do that. So if you, you know, have through your friendship networks or family networks, if you're able to kind of have those conversations and navigate it together um you know that that can be helpful but as you also said that's very difficult because even for a group of siblings everybody will have a completely different experience based on you know their relationship with the person who's died i was also just thinking david when you were talking about complexities of grief and what we've seen recently and over recent months due to covid19 and 
you know, the deaths because of the pandemic um, and how complex some of those have been and what will the lasting effects of that, you know, the coming years, how do you, how do you navigate when you've not been able to attend a funeral? Very painful. I mean, I watched a wonderful uncle of mine, my dad's eldest brother, died in New York over this period. And, you know, I would definitely have gone to the funeral. I would have loved to have been there and be with the whole family. And frankly, it was early on watching the funeral on Zoom for this wonderful man, my uncle Claude, was devastating. And of course, the, the, the thing about funerals such as that is that I would have gone to my uncle's funeral and revisited my relationship with my father, with my mother. You know, when you go, you always go to the funeral, always go to the funeral. It's therapy in of itself. I have to say, watching it on Zoom was one of the lowest moments of this lockdown experience. It was devastating. Do you ever think about your own death? I do think about my own death because both my parents were dead at 69. And I guess, you know, I, I sort of think, you know, how much longer do I have? And I'm, and I'm not convinced that I've got much longer than they had, to be honest. And that's, you know, my wife can't stand me talking like this. Um, but, you know, there have been these moments. That, the truth is, whilst my mother was around, I was very much still becoming. It was really after she went that I think as a person, psychologically and who I am today, I became husband, father of three children. Um, I went on to adopt my youngest, my wonderful, beautiful daughter. You know, my mother had been adopted. Um, so that was something my wife and I decided we wanted to do. Um, I have had, I had the riots in London that started in my constituency, um, the Windrush scandal, Grenfell, the uh, Brexit, these issues at which I've been at the you know forefront of public life, if you like. And the truth is that those things, you know, taking on those stresses on behalf of others to support others must take their toll. <laughs> so so um, I do think about, about, you know, my end. I want to say categorically, I mean, I hope I live a long life, but I, you know, it may not be as long as I'd like. And I, I've been so tremendously fortunate and lucky. I mean, despite, you know, pretty working class, poor background and lots of issues, I'm having a tremendous life. I'm tremendously blessed. So I don't say that in any sort of self-indulgent or morbid way, but I do, I do think about, about death, definitely. And I think as you were just describing as well with your wife saying, oh, don't talk about it. And lots of people who want maybe to talk about it um, or, or just do talk about it might be sort of hushed because, you know, you don't want to think about it. And oh, I don't I'm think it's hushed. something I mean, that... I, I, I do insist on talking about it. And, um, you know, they know exactly what the funeral is going to be like. Okay, that's what I was going <laughs> to ask. That was my next question. They, they, and, and we are very serious about the will and, all the practical things everything laid out and uh, and i've i've seen too much mess of not facing death of not fully focusing on the chaos you can leave behind if you don't make clear your wishes and your intent um in a transparent open and accountable way i'm afraid it can be incredibly painful for those who are left to come to terms with the fact that they they've lost someone um, so, no, I, uh, I, you know, I've had to support too many families in this situation. So I'm, I'm a great believer, be open, transparent, accountable, plan for eventualities. It's not, it's not sort of, you know, it's not morbid. It's the sensible thing to, to, to attend to um, if you're being a responsible adult. And there are lots of ways to make that journey easier, to, to, to find those moments um, you know, write things down that you that you want to happen, definitely. Before we finish, David, can I ask how you'd like to be remembered? Well, look, the most important thing for me are my children. You know, I, I lost my father at 12. So the most important thing for me is to guide my children to independent life, 
for them to have good well-being and mental health and to be as successful as they want to be in their lives um, and as one of my children's adopted that's particularly important so that's how I want to be remembered as having played a role uh, in, 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 in guiding them to whatever for them is success and well-being. I think in, in public life that is a matter for others, but I do work very hard. I, I, I hope that people feel that. Um, I want to have played my part in improving, um, you know, racial justice and race relations in this country, um, to have played a role in the criminal justice system, which I talk a lot about, and to have been a role model and lifted hopes and spirits that's how i'd like to be remembered but it, it's absolutely for others to determine um how well i've I, i've done that if anybody's listening right now and they're grieving so they're bereaved they've lost somebody close to them or they are caring for someone who's dying are there any words thoughts you might make well I found very useful um, poetry, actually. Um, and most often I turn to First World War poetry. It's the, it's the wonderful writings uh, of Wilfred Owen and others who, who, are, who are writing about um, facing death. And, you know, that period produced lots of poignant, beautiful, wonderful prose and poetry. And I personally found that somehow speaks to me. Um, I think the most important thing is you have to pace yourself. Our society is appalling at dealing with grief. It's all got to be over and you're back to work within a matter of weeks. It's not like that. My mother used to say, again, it's a sort of West Indian spiritual saying to me to encourage me on to do the best i could do live up to your ancestors prayers and uh, that's what i've tried to do and that's the way th through grief um you know in those moments as they are slipping away in whatever the circumstances and some of my ancestors it would have been pretty bleak circumstances live up to their prayers they were willing the future on and their descendants on and you know however tough it is is probably not nearly as tough as they faced it david lammy thank you so much for joining me today on the marie curie couch and being so open and honest and telling some wonderful stories i really really have enjoyed meeting you thank you very much So that's all for this episode of On the Marie Curie Couch. We hope it's got you thinking about matters of life and death and perhaps starting those conversations with your own friends and family. Marie Curie's here to help. From planning ahead to coping with bereavement, you can talk through any concerns you have around the end of life with our support line team, which also includes specially trained nurses. Call us on 0800 090 2309 or search Marie Curie online. This podcast is made by Marie Curie, a national charity that supports people affected by terminal illness. For more information and support, you can visit our website mariecurie.org.uk. The podcast is produced and edited by Marie Curie with support from Ultimate Sound and Vision. The music featured is Time Lapse by Pan Oceanic. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please do like and subscribe. Thanks for listening, and until next time, goodbye.